What is the uh, mission of uh, Breaking the Silence? So Breaking the Silence started as an organization in March 2004 by a group of soldiers that served in Hebron, uh, which is uh, one of the biggest cities in the, in the West Bank, south of Jerusalem, during the peak of the Second Intifada. 22 Israelis killed in Hebron, out of them a 10-month-year-old baby named Chalevet Pas, 88 Palestinians were killed, 64 of them were not involved in any violence or any actions against the army or the settlers, and two of them were actually killed by settlers themselves, a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old. Now this is what they were going through, and in this one year, even people that were totally with the mission, no questions, they realized that there's this crazy gap between what they're doing inside the army day in and day out and what their family, friends, communities know about back home. And this gap or this, this silence uh, uh, started to affect them and they said, look, well, there's some, something is going on here. I mean, we're, we're experiencing these things during, during our uh, service, but we're coming home. We can't bring this home to our, to our family's dinner table. Um, and eventually, after finishing their three years of service with questions, with thoughts, with discussions, they decided to put together an exhibition of pictures, of photos, of testimonies, very spontaneous, very not sophisticated, or very low-tech. And they thought this could start some sort of debate inside the Israeli society. Um, now, this debate uh, 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 actually was much wider than they expected, and thousands of people came to this very simple exhibition. They were also invited to show it in the Knesset, in the parliament, which today is unheard of with the, probably one of the most right-wing governments we'd ever, we, we ever had. Um, but maybe the most important thing that happened is that people from different units, different places, different times, came out and said, we can tell you the exact same story. And the story is not only a specific unit in Hebron in 2002, but the story is uh, paratroopers in 2000 in Nablus, or uh, Golani, which is another infantry brigade in 2003 in uh, Bethlehem, um, and they realize this isn't the specific story of a specific unit, but the story of a generation. I served from November 2004 to 2007. Um, what we do today in the organization is we um, focus on three major things. The first, the heart of our work is gathering testimonies, having the information uh, um, um, brought to the public, um, that we can have a real debate about what is happening and what is the moral price we're paying for controlling four million people. Um, we do educational work, bringing people to tours in Hebron or in the South Hebron Hills using our testimonies. And the third part of our work is lobby work because we understand that it can't only stay within the realm of a very specific group or community, but the idea is to increase resistance to the occupation and increase resistance to the occupation has to also go through political levels, also with the help of journalists, um, and this isn't only something that could stay or change um, um, with doing only educational work. So what's the sort of uh, experience um, while serving that actually gets a soldier to, to, to take what's quite a big step to speak out uh, a, a against uh, the Israeli armed forces? My dad was a paratrooper. I'm named after a paratrooper that was killed in the Yom Kippur War, 1973. This is an important, you know, it's not something uh, that starts when you enlist in the army, right? It's actually Israel, if you'd like it or not, especially big, not all, not all communities, but big parts of the communities are very militaristic. I mean, it's part of our society, it's part of our community. It, um, uh, in, in, the, in the communities that do join the army, and not everyone joins the army, but in the communities that do join the army, it's, uh, um, it's very clear that this is your next step after high school. So when I turned 18, I did the year of community service, but after that year I joined the army, I went to the paratroopers, I felt that I'm continuing you know, my family heritage or what I, what I was uh, supposed to do. And I have to say that I did enter the army with questions, but maybe not the right questions, maybe not all the questions, but I did you know, uh, um, feel that I'm like a good Jew, this is what I was told in, the, in, in the yeshiva, you have to walk around with question marks around your head. So I think I, I, went, I went into the army feeling I'm, I have the question marks. And the question marks was, how will I be a good soldier in a, in a shitty situation? How will I be a good soldier in a bad situation? And I thought I could be that soldier standing in a checkpoint and smiling when, while, while cars passing by. Or I could enter a house but walk around with candies in my pockets. And 
conduct a moral occupation, right? Which took me a while, but I realized this is a contradiction in terms. And when I, we started actually doing our actual service after almost a year and a couple of months of training, we started entering houses on a nightly basis um, and uh, uh, um, searching houses on a nightly basis or uh, going in to arrest people in the middle of the night, you realize that uh, it's impossible to be moral in an immoral situation. Um, and I think this is something that's extremely difficult for us to explain. I mean, we've been touring the States for three weeks and we came here for Australia, to Australia with a book which is called Our Harsh Logic. And I think the best uh, understanding of what this harsh logic is, understanding what the soldier is going through in his mindset. Um, and as a soldier, you rationalize situations. Now, your mission is uh, uh, to, to enter a house because uh, this is what you were asked to do. Um, it doesn't matter how how big your smile will be to the family, you're disrupting the day, their day-to-day -day life. Um, and when the orders we got were instill the sense of someone of, of fear, or to instill the sense of someone is of someone is chasing you, or to brand the consciousness of Palestinians, or like I said, like I said before, to disrupt the day-to-day -day life of Palestinians' population, this is what it looks like. And there's no way to do it nicely. And it's a further step. Um, behaviors like systematic humiliation, um, you know, even reaching to assault and, and torture. There's many ways I can approach this, but I think it, it's important to understand the three kinds of testimonies we gather. The two extreme uh, kinds of testimonies we gather. One extreme is what we all refer to as extreme cases, right? What uh, um, beating up, stealing, uh, uh, um, humiliating, um, taking pictures with dead bodies, or taking pictures with tied up Palestinians. We all know this happens. There's footage of this, there's discussions of this. What most Israelis, how most Israelis deal with this is they find a scapegoat. They say it's the soldier's fault, specifically him. What you have to do is enforce the law even harder on the soldiers. This is if you think it's a problem. There's many people that some of the incidents aren't even... We're only talking about the people that find this as a problem. The other kind of testimony are illegal things that happen. For example, using a human shield. Happened in the West Bank in 2003. There was a Palestinian that was killed after soldiers entered the house, used him as a human shield. He was injured and killed. And the Supreme Court decided this was illegal. Um, we have testimonies of soldiers doing uh, this in 2005, in 2006, and so on and so forth. 2009, there was a very uh, a famous case in Operation Cast Lead of using a human shield. Um, illegal, right? You did, you, shooting white phosphorus, and so on and so forth. Also, the illegal things, when people find that they're a problem, also a lot of people don't think they're even a problem, right? But people who find them problematic will say, well, it's illegal. It's very clear what you have to do. You have to send him to jail. But the heart of the testimony, right, the, 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 the ground of, the, the, of, of how these uh, 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 actions are growing is the day-to-day -day life, is the routine, are the things that no one questions, right? For example, entering a house for military purposes, what is called a straw widow. I took part in numerous straw widows, this is something that happens around the West Bank. Not really questioned, not considered illegal, not considered extreme. But when you have the order to enter a house and eventually do whatever you like in the house because you need it for military purposes, it's a very slippery slope. Because when you enter a house and only use it for an observation point, what do you do when your water is finished? Mm. And there's no other way to get water to you. Do you drink water or you don't drink water? What happens if your food finishes? Right? So when we're sitting here very comfortably, we say, of course, it's immoral to take someone's water or food without permission. Even though it's very easy to get permission when you have a helmet and gun, right? No one will say no to you. But this doesn't end. Like, what happens when you, if you have to take a shower in the house? And if you're in the house suddenly for 48 hours or three days? And if you're, you're allowed to sit on the sofa, allowed to put your legs on the table? The thing is that it's extremely easy to, uh, uh, to sterilize the discussion. Right, and say, well, it's very clear, it's either this or that. 
But the truth of the matter is, when you're standing in a checkpoint, you can be nice for the first hour. But after four hours of being hungry and hot or cold uh, and pissed off, and uh, uh, um, 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 the only way you can actually control people is by force, that's what you're going to do. Um, and it's not uh, a chance that we see the same testimonies coming up at the beginning of the Second Intifada, in the middle of in the in, in the in the middle of uh, uh, the past decade, and yesterday, you know, or tonight, we'll go today, we'll go see what's happening in the West Bank. We'll see similar stories. I mean, is there is there any kind of uh, de facto or maybe even officially uh, sanctioned or promoted? you know, racist culture that acts as a justifying or, um, you know, or motivating uh, force. Is this part of the reality of, of, of Israeli occupation? Listen, it has to be part. It has to be part. In order to understand what is happening in the occupation, and this is where there is a difference between what's happening in the rest of Israel, is in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, everything, of course, is under Israeli control in the wider sense. There's a difference between Israel's control in, in the West Bank and Israel's control in Gaza, but we are still controlling both pieces of land. The law there, and it doesn't matter what your politics are, is a different law than the rest of Israel. Right? We're talking about one area that has civilian law, right? where people have the right to vote, where people have a political power, where people can go out to the street and demonstrate, and it's legal. In the West Bank, it's army law, it's martial law, and it's not by the people for the people, it's by Israel for Israel. Now, of course, this is every occupation, this isn't new, but two important things we have to remember. First of all, is this has been going on for 45 years, and as we see on the ground, and this is part of what we're trying to show with the book, there's no exit strategy, we're working on the ground with no end in sight. And the second thing is, we started for different reasons, ideological reasons, uh, security reasons, some people would say, uh, to mobilize Jewish communities from Israel into the West Bank. And when we started to mobilize them, we created a situation that de facto there is never a possibility for equality. Because you're talking about 350, together with East Jerusalem, five half a million Jewish settlers that are under Israeli civilian law. And two and a half million Palestinians that are under army law, under martial law, right? They'll never be equal. If you have two people meeting in the heart of Hebron, both in the same exact moment pick up a rock and throw it at each other, but one is Palestinian and one, wasn't, one, is, one is Israeli, the Israeli would be tried under civilian law. Right? The Palestinian would be tried as a terrorist, doing the exact same thing. Now, we, we can go on and give more examples with mistreating of children, right? Which uh, a, a, a Palestinian child will not be treated the same as an Israeli child because there's a different law. That's where we understand that there'll never be equality and there'll always be, you could call it racism, and I think this is part of the story. And, and the bottom line, there's there, the, the, the idea of differentiating between two populations is part of the story. And part of what we talk about in, in the book that I'm uh, uh, um, here to, to, to promote is uh, the idea of separation. This is the second chapter of the book. Most people really think that we're uh, spending most of our time separating Israelis from Palestinians, but that's only part of what we're doing. We're, we're, they're already separated by law, but we're also in doing another thing, which is separating Palestinians from Palestinians. And that's actually what we're spending most of our time doing. And uh, uh, this idea of uh, separation is already implemented on the ground when we actually broke down what we see the occupation is into four pillars, right? The occupation is a chair, the four legs of the chair, where these are actually terms that most soldiers know about, and actually even most Israelis know about, but they're referred to in a positive connotation. The first one is prevention, right? You prevent something bad from happening to someone good, can't be bad. Separation, like I mentioned, most of the international community is talking about the two-state solution, that's separation isn't initially evil, right? We can debate if it's the right solution or not, but uh, the third is fabric of life, allowing the Palestinians to maintain their fabric of life. Sounds excellent. And law enforcement. And what we try to do in the book 
is actually to break that down and to uh, 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 discover what these terms actually mean. In Hebrew, the word pre prevention means sikul. When you tell an Israeli sikul, the first thing that comes to mind is sikul mimukad, targeted prevention, which is a lib uh, the, the best way to uh, uh, translate that, or targeted uh, killing, assassinations. You have a ticking bomb scenario, Palestinian strapped with a bomb to him, leaving a big Palestinian city to a major Israeli city. It isn't new, this happened, uh, happened during the Second Intifada. Um, um, I remember, you know, being scared driving on buses in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. This is something that we remember. Um, and we have to stop this ticking bomb scenario and we use this tool which is called targeted killing, assassinations. This, I think most of Israelis will agree, is something we have to do. But this already went, also up, went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, you can use this tool as targeted assassinations only in the case of a ticking bomb scenario. But this is only the tip of this idea. We actually made it wider and wider and wider. And we continued on using this tool of targeted assassinations and killing people that haven't, that aren't a ticking bomb scenario, but could be involved in violence, could be involved with what Israel sees as terror against Israelis or settlements, and could uh, 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 or could def or could de are definitely uh, uh, people that Israel could arrest, but we couldn't get our hands on them, so we assassinate them. Right? This is taking us the next level down, of course, with no trial, with no. But it doesn't end there. Right? We also assassinate people for different reasons, political reasons. It happened in Gaza many times. Um, and the widest idea of this idea of prevention or targeted prevention is actually revenge killings. And we know about a dozen revenge killings. One of the famous ones is in February 19, 2002, in a checkpoint near Ramallah called En Arik. Six Israeli soldiers were killed by Palestinians. The next night, uh, three different units were launched to three different places, two in the West Bank, one in Gaza. The orders they got, this is a revenge attack. Everyone standing in a checkpoint at a specific time at night, you shoot the kill. At the end of the night, 15 Palestinian policemen were found dead. Now this isn't a local officer's decision. This is at least the chief of staff, if not higher. There was a, a piece in one of the Israeli newspapers talking about this. Um, but this is only one example of the idea of prevention. Mm -hmm. And we managed to take this very tip of idea of prevention, for example, arrests, make it wider and wider. So we first arrest the people we thought we have to arrest, then we arrest their neighbors or their cousins, and then we have mass arrests, mm -hmm. right? arresting everyone between 18 and 35, but the biggest idea of prevention that affects every Palestinian is what we call having our presence felt. Mm. And how do you have your presence felt? You're there every minute, mm. every Palestinian, doesn't matter what he's involved in, doesn't matter what you do, he does for a living, he has to know you're right here. Mm. And we talk about entering houses, besides the fact that we're using the houses as military, military uh, outposts, this is another a, 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 a way to have our presence felt. It's another way to show that we're always there. Well, another pillar is separation, and of late, more and more commentators, some of whom Israeli commentators, have said, you know, this is this is the same idea as apartheid, separation, apartheid, separate. Uh, what's your comment on that? Well, I, I didn't live in uh, uh, South Africa under apartheid. I don't know what it really looks like. I read read about it in books. Um, I, what I know and what we're experts in is the Israeli occupation. Um, now, I don't, I, I can't say I'm, I don't have the legal background. I don't have the historical background to say if, uh, uh, if legally this is what it is or if it isn't. What I can say is this is what it looks like, and this looks very bad. When we talk about the idea of separation, this is definitely part of what is happening in the West Bank today. I think that uh, um, focusing and trying to find out if this is apartheid or isn't apartheid is pushing us away from the real issue, which is this is occupation, this is what it looks like, this is what it means to be a soldier that's conducting occupation, this is what it means to be a Palestinian living under occupation, let's deal with that. When we talk about separation, one of the cities that we deal with, with that we're, we're in 
almost four times a week is a city called Hebron, which I mentioned. And in the heart of Hebron, we're actually separating Israelis from Palestinians, besides the fact that we separated both sides of the city. The Israeli part, there's still 30,000 Palestinians and 700 Jewish settlers. And the heart of the city, right, which used to be the biggest market in Hebron, is actually a road which is a sterile road. Me, which means Palestinians are not allowed to walk on this road. There's actually people living in the houses on top of this road. Used to be 30 families, now only five are left. But they can't even leave the front door of their house. Now, in my perspective, not only that this has nothing to do with the Israel that I want to be proud of, this has nothing to do with the Judaism I believe in, and this has nothing to do with taking us towards a solution. Now, the answer to what my claims are could be, well, this is security. And what can you do for security? This is what you have to do. The last Israeli killed in Hebron was in 2003. Right? The peak of the Second Intifada, which I mentioned earlier, was a very difficult time, to say the least both for Israelis and for Palestinians. And maybe the idea then was, okay, let's separate the two communities. Uh, of course, we have to remember that the idea of separation started in Gold, with, with Goldstein's massacre in 1994. We, go, we won't get into that, but it wasn't only... Be, the, the separation didn't start with Palestinian violence in Hebron. It actually started with Jewish terror and Jewish violence, which is important to say. But when we talk about what is happening today in Hebron, you know, October 2012, or almost 2013, almost 10 years after the last Israeli killed in Hebron, we're still talking about 1,800 stores shut down on military orders. We're talking about 70% unemployment. We're talking about Palestinians not being allowed to walk on some streets, drive in some streets, or open stores in streets. And we're actually pushing them into a different part of the city, which theoretically, again, could be legitimate if we're saying, you could live there and we could live here. But what we're seeing all over the West Bank, and Hebron is only a microcosm of that, is that we're slowly pushing Palestinians into, clo into uh, smaller areas, what is called Area A and Area B, which are together fo less than 40% of the West Bank. Okay? So it, it doesn't matter what uh, 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 um, our viewers or what your opinions are, if, it's so, if we should have a one state or a two state, uh, uh, but any sort of solution regarding this, uh, uh, um, regarding, or, or, or that will bring us to end the occupation, has to acknowledge the fact that we can't allow uh, a more illegal outposts to be built while pushing Palestinians out of Area C. It's the biggest part of the West Bank, more than 64%, and we're actually uh, uh, slowly but surely making sure there won't be Palestinians there and de facto annexing the land.